Welcome to the Women in Wellness Podcast. This is your place to get the latest up-to-date health and wellness information specifically for women, while providing you practical tools you can implement today. I'm Dr. Caitlin Sazowski, and I wanted to personally thank you for spending part of your day with me. Hello, Women in Wellness Tribe. It is Dr. Caitlin, and I have a super knowledgeable guest with me today. I'm really excited to have this conversation with her, and I know you guys are dying for this information because it is going to pretty much entail every single one of us at some point in our life. So today, I have Dr. Deb Matthews, who's a medical doctor, turned functional medicine doctor, which is super awesome. And she is the happy hormone doctor, which is a, she's also a best-selling author, international speaker, educator, wife, mother of four, busy lady. And before I read like why she got into it, um, I'm actually going to have her tell you guys, but she's also been featured on national podcasts, radio shows, broadcast shows, including NBC, ABC, CBS, and Fox. So we are very fortunate to have Dr. Debbie with us, Dr. Deb. So thank you so much. I really appreciate you being with us. I'm excited to be here. So Dr. Deb, it is not common for medical doctors to get into the functional realm. Why did you switch over to, you know, what most people think is the dark side? Well, you know, I didn't know anything about nutrition or any of that. It's just not what we're taught at medical school. But what I did know is that I did not feel good. I was healthy by like most standards, but I was exhausted all the time. My favorite hobby was napping and I got so irritable. I felt so guilty for being the worst mom ever for constantly shrieking at my kids. And my poor husband is the one that really bore the brunt of my Wicked Witch of the West impersonation. You know, one minute I could think, oh, he's the greatest guy ever. And then just like that, I would think, what was I thinking? Why did I marry this buffoon? And you know, it made his head spin. And, and I didn't understand what was going on because nothing in my medical training really explained this. But what changed for me is I read a book by Suzanne Summers. Mm -hmm. And you can just imagine how much medical doctors love to get our medical information from celebrities, right? And especially like Chrissy Snow from Three's Company, she was that Titsy Blonde. But I knew that something was wrong and I knew that I had to do something and I didn't know what else to do. So I read the book and it changed my whole life because when I read about the stories in the book about women who were just like me um, and how much better they felt when they got their hormones balanced, that allowed me to open my mind and realize that there are other ways of doing things. I found places that I could go to be retrained and I learned this whole idea of a functional medicine approach where we're looking for the root cause of the problems instead of just always prescribing medications, which most of the time just put a Band-Aid on the symptom. They're not really fixing the underlying problem. And so once I was able to get my hormones back in balance, I got my energy back, my kids got their mom back, my husband got his wife back, and I got my life back, but I could not go back to just writing prescriptions all day long because it just didn't make any sense anymore. So I've actually been practicing functional medicine longer than I was practicing, you know, the regular conventional medicine. I've been doing this now for 14 years. I love what I do, and I feel like I can make so much more of an impact in my patients' lives. Isn't it? It's the most rewarding thing when, you know, our women clients come back in and they're like, I feel like myself again. You know, my kids are happy to be around me. My husband's not running for the hills. Um, you know, I love my job again. And realistically, none of those things changed because just like you, I've had women come and go, I hate my husband. My kids are shitheads, you know, like my job's awful. My boss is this, my house sucks. And they're just listing off everything that right. they dislike. And then once their hormones are balanced, they're like, oh, my kids are the most thoughtful yeah. and my husband is the most amazing man. And my boss is, none of those things changed. It was just them, their hormones balance. Yes. So 
<laughs> I'm so glad that you do this. And thank you because you actually do something that I don't do. And um, I think it's, there's definitely a time and a place for it. So were you going to say something before I was going to just like dive in and pick your brain on no, our topic? I was, I was just going to agree with you and just share a little story about how, you know, if, if you don't feel good as a woman and you go to your doctor and you complain, I'm grouchy, I have no energy, I don't feel like doing anything, you know, all those things that you listed off, they got nothing for that, right? They've got Prozac or sleeping pills, or right? There's no pill for that. There's no medicine to fix that. Um, and you're not really sick in the traditional sense of the word. So they really have nothing to offer. But the kinds of stories that I hear back from women is like, like success stories is, I haven't had a fight with my husband in the whole month since I started working with you. And we're like, yay, but that's not what doctors are trained to deal with. So that's why looking for another approach can make a big difference. Oh my gosh. And I love what you said before we hit record was, you know, your body better than anybody. So if you don't feel well, you have to be your own advocate and keep looking for somebody that's going to listen and do something different than what you've already done. Unless you try something for a week and quit, <laughs> a week is not long enough to get you uh, a lot of those changes that most women are looking for. But so Dr. Deb, what is it that you mostly focus on in your practice? So my main focus is on bioidentical hormones. And the word bioidentical means that the hormones are an exact match for the hormones that your body is supposed to be making. So at least in theory, your body should not be able to tell the difference between whether these hormones came from your ovaries or whether they came from the pharmacy. And that just sort of seems like common sense to me. But the reality is that pharmaceutical companies for decades and decades have been making hormones that we've been using for women that are synthetic chemicals. They're drugs. They're things that have never been found in women's bodies. They are made to mimic our hormones. So they're very similar to our hormones, but they're not the exact same thing. And that turns out to be really important. And, you know, when I was in medical school, they didn't explain that these chemical drugs that we're trained to prescribe aren't the same thing. And even today, there are doctors who prescribe hormones to women who actually don't know whether the hormone that they're prescribing is the exact same as what's in a woman's body or whether it's a chemical, because it's not really considered to be important. But here's why I think it is important. The way that all hormones work is the hormone attaches to a receptor in your cell. It's like a lock and a key. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, if you've ever had a key that's close, it's not the right key for the lock, but it's kind of close. If you really kind of jiggle it and ram it in, you can get it into the lock, right? Um, but once you really jam it in there, it doesn't turn. Like you can twist it, but, but it just doesn't really work. And then when you try to pull it out, a lot of times it's really hard to get the key out of the lock. So this is sort of similar to how these synthetic chemicals work. They can dock into the hormone receptors in your cells, but they don't always activate them in quite the same way. They don't always release in quite the same way. So we get some of the benefits, but not always all of the benefits. And then there can be side effects if you have too much or too little of any hormone, but sometimes we get added side effects or negative effects that we hadn't really counted on in the first place mm -hmm. when we were designing these drugs. So whenever we're talking about hormones for women, it's really important that if we want to replace a hormone, we want to replace the real hormone, not a chemical imposter. Love it. Yeah. I think it's really important for women to understand the difference. And one of the things that are the examples that I use is like the keys for cars, like the old time cars where you had like a key for the door and then a key for the ignition to start it. Well, the key for the door fit the ignition, but it wouldn't turn the car on. And that's essentially what I envision when I start thinking about the synthetic hormones that our body can somewhat recognize like it fits, but it just doesn't turn our body on. It doesn't do what it's supposed to do. So it's great visual. Exactly. So why... So the bioidentical looks the same. So it goes into those receptors, it docks, and it's able to turn on the same functions as if our ovaries made it. Why, why would somebody want to be put on bioidentical hormones? Like what would be some symptoms that they may be experiencing that would 
maybe allude to, hey, maybe my hormones are out of whack and I might want to try bioidentical for a period of time. Yeah. Well, we use bioidentical hormones mostly for women going through perimenopause and menopause. And so if you're a woman over say 35 and you're kind of starting to tippy toe into perimenopause territory, the hormone that usually goes downhill first is progesterone. And progesterone is the calming hormone. It helps us feel relaxed and calm and easygoing. And we sleep soundly through the night. So we feel refreshed to the next day. And so as our progesterone level goes down, we can feel more anxious, more irritable, negative, critical, impatient, and maybe not always the best version of ourselves. And I can tell you that that was my problem. I, every time my kids would do something, my head would spin around and flames would shoot out of my ears. And I'd use this exorcist voice to scream at them. And, you know, and then I just felt so guilty. And I remember a patient of mine describing how she felt. She was she was not quite going off the deep end as far as I was, fortunately, but what she would describe is when her progesterone was low, she would look around her house and she would see dust bunnies under her furniture. And those dust bunnies would make her completely crazy. But once we got her hormones balanced, she would sit there and she would see, oh, there's some dust bunnies. I'll get to them at some point. So it just affects our, our hormones affect who we are on the inside, how we relate to other people, how we react to the world around us. So progesterone is the calming one. So a woman who is, you know, in her late 30s and her 40s, um, who is just not feeling as calm, cool, and collected, who is not sleeping soundly, who's getting night sweats, um, that's a common thing that we see when progesterone is low. Um, I, I used to wake up in the middle of the night with panic attacks for no apparent reason out of the blue. Um, and that was because my progesterone level was low and that completely went away once I got that resolved. Um, weight gain, especially in the hips and the thighs, thyroid issues beginning because progesterone helps with thyroid function. Um, and then menstrual changes. So more irregular periods, heavier periods, shorter cycles. So now periods are starting, you know, instead of every 28 days, now every 25 days or 23 days or 21 days. And PMS can get really bad. So progesterone helps to minimize PMS symptoms. And when progesterone goes downhill, all those regular things, the bloating and the breast tenderness and the fluid retention, all those things can get worse. Mm -hmm. They can last longer. So they can, instead of, you know, if it, if you have PMS for one day out of the month, well, okay, you'll get over it, right? You can deal with it. But if it's five days, seven days, 10 days, sometimes women complain like two whole weeks out of the cycle, they just don't feel like themselves. So these are all the kinds of things that progesterone can help with. And I do want to say that it's not always necessary to jump right to, oh, I think this is my problem. And, and we can talk about, you know, measuring hormone levels to prove that this is your problem. But if we know that low progesterone, or we call this estrogen dominance, because it's the balance between estrogen and progesterone. If we know that's the issue, we don't have to jump right to hormone replacement therapy and jump right to giving you progesterone. There's a lot of things that maybe we'll have some time to talk about that you can do ahead of that to help get your hormones back in balance but it's when those things don't work or they're not enough that we can add the progesterone. Oh, I love, love, love that you said it's not like the very first thing that you do, that there's other things that we try to balance because it really does seem like your root cause kind of doctor, like, let's find out why this is happening. Exactly. And then if those things don't work, we can add in um, those, I don't know, additional right. uh, helpers to make right. us feel better. So it, in my approach would be, I, I'm always looking at, f at the whole person, not just at the hormones. And I'm always looking at four pillars of health. So I want to look at the hormone balance. I want to look at gut health. I want to look at toxins in the environment and lifestyle habits. Mm -hmm. But when we're addressing somebody, we work through it backwards. So we want to work on your lifestyle first, your nutrition, your stress, et cetera. And then we want to help detox because there's so many hormones so many chemicals that are hormone disruptors that cause the problems in the first place. And we need you to have a healthy gut because that's very, very important for hormone balance. And once we've got those things, well, then the icing on the cake is we add back in whatever hormones that you want. So it needs to be a whole person approach. And it's not just that you're getting a prescription for a natural hormone instead of a prescription for a synthetic hormone. So 
I feel like when women go to their doctor to say, I'm really interested in bioidentical hormones, mm -hmm. what they're meaning or, or what, what we really mean by that is I'm looking for a whole person holistic approach that's going to help balance my hormones. But what their medical doctor is hearing is I want this prescription instead of that prescription. It's just not the same thing. No, those are two very different um, approaches to uh, trying to address hormone imbalance. So outside of, and if you want to, we can dive into, okay, so what would be some of the things that we would um, do prior to jumping into the bioidentical hormone? Sure. Sorry, my dog here. <laughs> um, so we can maybe, if we stick with perimenopause for a second, and then we can talk mm. about the menopausal hormones, but stress is a super humongous cause of hormone imbalances mm -hmm. for women. We are trying to homeschool our kids and work from home and, you know, take care of our parents and be on the PTA. Like we're trying to do everything for everybody. We are not good at taking care of ourselves, but when we are stressed, our cortisol levels go up. Cortisol is the hormone that helps us cope with stress. And our bodies can actually use progesterone to make more cortisol. So when we have a lot of stress in our lives and our cortisol gets out of whack because of chronic stress, it can impact menstrual cycles, fertility, um, sleep, mood, et cetera, et cetera. So a lot of women will come in the door because they've seen the list of all the progesterone related symptoms. Check, 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 I got all of these. I need progesterone. But if we could correct this, help them with their stress, correct their cortisol, then a lot of those symptoms melt away. Mm -hmm. And the younger you are, the more likely it is that there's some reason that needs to be fixed. So if you're 49, your ovaries may well have stopped really producing progesterone because you're in perimenopause. Okay, fine. You really might need some progesterone. If you're 29, that is not perimenopause pause, you can certainly have low progesterone, that estrogen dominance, much more likely that it's something else. And a really common one is stress. So breathing exercises, meditation, yoga, laughter, prayer, walking, being in nature. There's so many things that we could do to help balance the stress in our lives, but it's hard to put those on our to-do list. If we do sit down to maybe do some breathing exercises or some meditation, so many of us are really running through that list in our head. Oh, I got to remember to pick up the milk at the grocery store. I really ought to be unloading the dishwasher. Did his soccer jersey get laundered? You know, so it's hard sometimes to cope with stress, but it's such an important factor when we're going to balance mm -hmm. hormones. And a really quick and easy trick, if I can share one, mm -hmm. is gratitude. So no matter how stressed out, freaked out, overwhelmed, exhausted you're feeling in that moment, if you can just stop and think of three things that you're grateful for, there's always something, right? The sky is blue today. You could be grateful for that. So if you stop and think of three things that you're grateful for, really helps shift priorities, helps you kind of realize whatever this crazy thing is that you're dealing with at the moment, it's going to be over soon. And um, it, it's hard to feel exhausted, overwhelmed, fe fearful, and anxious and feel grateful at the same time. So it really helps to shift. So that's a really quick tip for how to cope mm. with stress. I love it. It is so important that we um, experience more happiness and joy because when we're smiling and laughing, there's less room for uh, all of those like muscles to tense up and it really makes a huge difference. So I love that in the moment, think of three things that you're grateful for at that time. And they could be as small as you want them to be or as big as you want them to be, but it does massively shift our brain and perspective. Awesome. It sure does. So a, a couple of other ones that are lifestyle tips to help get your hormones mm -hmm. in balance is nutrition, mm -hmm. eating whole foods, not processed foods, really watching the sugar and starchy carbs because we want stable blood sugar levels. Mm -hmm. um, blood sugar swings cause hormone swings. Um, we want to make sure that you're getting enough of the healthy fats, enough of the fruits and vegetables, enough fiber in your diet. So healthy nutrition is, is really critical. Mm -hmm. And of course, any woman who has ever experienced PMS knows that when you are in the midst of hormone imbalances, 
you know, don't feel like broccoli, right? We want the Ben and Jerry, we want all the wrong stuff. And, and it's really important to do your best to try to respect your body, feed your body the nutrition that it needs, not necessarily what you want in the moment is to, to do your best because nutrition makes a really big difference. And then one more tip would be to do your best to avoid toxins. Mm -hmm. So many chemicals in the environment are hormone disruptors, which means they mess up how your hormones work and they create these hormone symptoms. So once again, the younger you are, if you're having these issues, the, the more likely it is that there's some of these other factors that are causing the problem in the first place and the more we can help. So it's hard to avoid all the toxins in the environment, but um, you know, learning a little bit about which are the most important ones, taking some small steps that have some big impacts can be really important. And, and one quick one would be to avoid plastic in your kitchen. Switch to glass, don't use the plastic wrap when you're putting things in the microwave. Um, avoiding plastic in your kitchen is not that hard to do and can make a difference. It absolutely can. And, you know, we've, we've talked about uh, kitchen swaps in the past. Um, one of the great things instead of using plastic baggies now is they have like food grade silicone ones that they're a little pricey in the beginning when you buy them, but they don't, like you don't throw them out. So you just right. wash them and reuse them. So that's better great. for the environment. Yeah. Oh, heck yeah. Um, so I love it. Looking at toxins, making sure our nutrition is balanced. So not eating the foods that we can't even read what the ingredients are. That's usually uh, an indication that I tell everyone I work with, if you can't pronounce the word, don't eat it. Not worth it. Yeah. So what would be... So we went through like trying to address the, the root cause first. And let's say they're eating really clean, they're meditating, their stress levels are being managed. I'm not saying completely go away because I don't know how that's even possible. Um, but we've worked on detox pathways. They're eliminating their uh, current toxic exposure. So they're not constantly reintoxicating themselves. If they still don't feel right, what do you do at that point? Yeah. So at that point, what I would suggest would be to have your hormone levels tested. Mm -hmm. And it's really important that they're tested correctly. If you march into your gynecologist's office or your family practice office on any random Thursday afternoon and they draw some blood, it's going to be kind of irrelevant because your hormones change over your menstrual cycle. So we have to be measuring the hormones at the right time of your menstrual cycle in order to give us the right information. And almost always... Um, I, I hear women complain about these, these same problems, which is my doctor told me we don't do that. My doctor told me I'm too young to have a hormone problem or my doctor told me my labs were normal. And that's the most frustrating one of all, right? Like if you're so normal, why do you feel so bad? And I, I feel like doctors wanna reassure you, like you don't have a disease, it's not cancer, like great, but why do I not feel good? So in order to do the hormones properly for women who are perimenopausal, premenopausal, we really want to try to get your hormone levels done about a week before your period is due, because that's the time in your menstrual cycle when your progesterone levels are supposed to be at their peak. It's mainly the two weeks before your period. And those tend to be, there's a pattern that we see with symptoms, which is those two weeks before your period, especially the last week, tend to be the weeks when we're not at our best. We want to eat everything in the fridge. We're grouchy. We're tired. We don't feel like doing stuff. We're just not at our best. Night sweats, not sleeping well, et cetera. Once we get on our period, we start to feel better. And then the week after the period is usually the good week. That's the week when you're cleaning out your closets, you're chopping your broccoli, you're going to Zumba class. So if you get your labs done when you're on your period, your hormone levels are gonna be low because they're supposed to be low that week. Mm -hmm. And if you get your levels done during the good week, your estrogen will be okay. The progesterone is still supposed to be low. They're gonna be high when you're ovulating. It changes over your cycle. So. If you don't get the labs done at the right time of the cycle, we can't really interpret them. But that would be the next step would be have your hormones tested, but needs to be done right. And I would argue that we shouldn't only measure your female hormones, but just as a baseline for me, I would want to also look at your stress hormones like the cortisol and a full thyroid panel because all of these hormones work together and so we don't want to just focus on any one hormone by itself mm -hmm. 
And then if, if we've confirmed that, yes, your progesterone level is too low and we're addressing whatever other hormone issues we found, we're still working on your lifestyle habits, that would be when we can actually add in some bioidentical progesterone. And progesterone is available both by a prescription and it is available over the counter as a topical cream. Um, and typically it's used the two weeks before your period um, because you don't you know, we stop it when you're on your period, you don't usually need it the week after your period, but it's used in a cyclic way, which is how your body naturally does it. Where it gets really tricky is if you've had a partial hysterectomy, so you still got your ovaries, your hormones are still going, but you don't have a period. So who knows when you're, when the right time is, or if you have an IUD, which again, a lot of women with an IUD don't have a period, or some women have had an ablation, which treats the lining of their uterus so that they don't bleed anymore. Um, and a lot of times these things are done precisely because women are having these horrible heavy periods. And one of the major causes of horrible heavy periods is lack of progesterone. So if you've had some of these things done on purpose because of horrible heavy periods, you really probably do have low progesterone, but we don't really know when to measure your levels. So it makes it tricky. It's not impossible, but again, it needs to be done in a thoughtful way and not just random labs done on whatever random Thursday afternoon you happen to be in your doctor's office. Yep. So what labs do you typically run? Do you do blood? Do you do urine? Do you do saliva? So I do all of the above under certain circumstances, and this is a big topic and functional medicine doctors debate this all the time. <laughs> so what I would say to keep it simple is for somebody who's not on any kind of hormone replacement therapy, that just their own natural body's hormones, any of the above will work. There are some pros and cons. We can get some more information from um, Dutch urine testing. Mm -hmm. um, saliva testing um, is one of the things we can do over the whole cycle. So we can map your whole menstrual cycle. Blood testing is easier to get. It can be covered by your health insurance. So there's pros and cons to each one, but but I would say it's more important to have the hormones done at the right time by somebody who knows how to interpret the results than to worry over which manner they're gonna do the test. Absolutely. Being able to actually interpret the results right. is so important. Right. I can't tell you how many times I've had clients go, do you mind explaining these labs to my doctor? I'm like, no. Yeah. Even if I explain them, it's not to say that they would fully understand it anyway. And I don't think your doctor wants me to teach them how to read labs. So no, not a good place Doesn't to go. Doesn't go over well. Yeah. No. So what would be the pros of doing bioidentical and some of the cons, like after the right testing's done, the interpretation's done properly, what would yeah. be... So, so I hope that we'll get a chance to talk about menopause too, because it's a little okay. different from menopause, but okay. from perimenopause, I don't think that there's a lot of cons. So okay. if we assume that it's a correct diagnosis, and that you're getting a reasonable dose because for any hormone, you can have a side effect with too much or too little, it's kind of like Goldilocks, we want just right. But assuming that you've got it just right, progesterone um, helps with quality of sleep, helps you feel more calm, it is breast protective. So at least logically, we would expect that if you are a, are a premenopausal woman, this uh, having a lack of progesterone is the kind of environment that could help a breast cancer cell grow and we should be able to replace the progesterone. It should hinder breast cancer cells from growing. So it would be lovely if we had humongous studies to prove that, but because we're not using prescription drugs that make the pharmaceutical companies a lot of money, there's not a lot of incentive to pay for that study. So unfortunately, we have to just use common sense and theorize that that would be the case because it is breast protective. Um, and only the natural stuff, the synthetic drug versions of progesterone are the opposite. Those are the ones like in birth control pills and the synthetic hormone replacement that could potentially increase the risk for breast cancer a tiny bit, not a huge risk, but a tiny bit. But so in any case, they make women feel better, sleep better, thyroid work better, scalp hair grow on our head, bones stronger, good for brain health, um, great for mood. So the downsides would be if you get the wrong dose, if you get too much, it can be sedating. So it's great if you're like anxious and freaking out all the time and it makes you calm, but it could make you too calm and heavy and drowsy. And, and that's just a sign that the dose is wrong. Mm. It's supposed to reduce PMS symptoms, but too much can cause more breast tenderness, fluid retention, bloating. It's just a sign that the dose is too wrong. So in my opinion, for perimenopausal women, um, assuming that it's done correctly, there's really not a whole heck of a lot in terms of downsides. Is there a problem if they're on it too long? So let's say like a 37 year old comes into you, they're experiencing all of these perimenopausal symptoms. That's 
that's too early in my books. Is there a length of time that you would say, okay, we're going to work on the detox. We're going to work on the lifestyle. Let's use some bioidentical progesterone to help you get through, you know, that slump, that feeling icky. Is there a time where you would look and maybe like back it off and see sure. if you, if their body picks up the function or uh, yeah, the function of making progesterone? Yeah. So the younger a woman is, the greater the likelihood that we would only need this temporarily to get her, like you said, you know, over the hump, mm-hmm. especially if you are exhausted, overwhelmed, anxious, et cetera. It's hard to chop your broccoli and meditate and do all those things we're trying to get you to do. So sometimes feeling better with the progesterone can help you to do all the things that you know, you're trying to do. And then you can kind of get into a better place and then you don't need the progesterone anymore. So the younger you are, the greater the chance that you'll be able to just use it temporarily. Once you're kind of uh, you know, getting closer towards 50, your ovaries don't ovulate anymore. You really don't make progesterone anymore. So there's gonna be a time where you know, it's, it's not gonna come back. Um, and in that case, we would sort of suggest to continue on the progesterone. It makes the, pen, the menopausal process kind of smoother. Um, so the good thing about bioidentical hormones is they're always optional. You can stop them anytime you like. You don't have to stay on them ever, um, but there's no need to, to hurry up and come off them. And that's, again, totally the opposite um, compared with the synthetic hormones, because the synthetic form of progesterone is the one that actually was increasing the risk for breast cancer. It wasn't estrogen. Um, and so the conventional wisdom in menopausal hormone replacement is use them for the least time necessary, get off them as soon as possible, because we know that there's a small increase in the risk for breast cancer. Of course, we want you to get off. But if we're using the bioidentical hormones, things are different. Can we maybe talk about estrogen? Yes, sure. So so you go through your perimenopausal time in your life. At some point, somewhere in the general ballpark of 50 years old, your ovaries kind of conk out, you go through menopause, and everything's different now. So the main symptoms that women experience when they go through menopause are, of course, the hot flashes which can sometimes be mild and they can sometimes be really annoying. Um, I have to say though, if hot flashes was the only symptom that you had, you'd probably get through, like it's annoying, but right. The more problematic parts of this is that your brain doesn't work great. Estrogen is super important for your brain. You start having these senior moments, right? Where you can't remember why you walked in the room and where you left the car keys and where you parked the car and what's that person's name. And you can't find that word that's right on the tip of your tongue. That's so common. Um, And it affects mood. So estrogen is like a natural antidepressant. So you just kind of can get more flat, more irritable, more tired. You don't sleep as well. Skin changes, your skin kind of ages right before your eyes. And it also affects urinary tract. So we can have more urinary leakage, more urinary tract infections, the vaginal dryness intercourse can become painful. Um, We want to keep intimacy in relationships. That's really an important piece of relationships. And this can be really hard on intimacy. So there's lots of things that change when women go through menopause and estrogen replacement has become very controversial. A lot of women are very frightened of hormone replacement therapy because everybody quote unquote knows that estrogen increases the risk for breast cancer. And the reality is that if a woman has breast cancer, then in many cases, the estrogen could promote the growth of the breast cancer, but it doesn't cause you to get breast cancer in the first place. So we have studies that show that when we give women balanced hormones, so that would be the estrogen with the natural form of progesterone, that in these studies, statistically, there is not an increase in the risk for breast cancer. If we give you estrogen all by itself, there's a very tiny risk. But if we give you estrogen with the synthetic drug form, the, the progesterone that's made by the pharmaceutical company, there is an increase in the risk. It's not an enormous increase, but nonetheless, why would you want that? If we do estrogen with progesterone, statistically, we do not see an increase in the risk. And that hasn't really made the news. When, mm-hmm. when a study came out back in 2002 that said hormone replacement increased the risk for breast cancer, it was the synthetic stuff, the drugs, but that made the news, women got frightened off of hormone replacement in droves. So it became a really scary topic. When I was in medical school before that in the nineties, they were teaching us that all women should go on hormone replacement therapy for their own good because it was gonna protect their heart, their brain and their bones. So that was kind of paternalistic and we were given everybody the same dose and we know it's kind of Goldilocks, right? Not too much, not too little, just right. So how we were doing it before, the way I was taught at medical school, 
not the best way. Using the synthetics is not the best way. But if we can personalize this, if we can give women the balanced hormones in the doses that are best for them, we can have tremendous health co- outcomes in terms of heart health, brain health, bone health, sexual health, quality of life, skin health, um, and, and it can make a really big difference. I think the big thing that you're saying is the quality of the hormone that you're taking. Is it synthetic? Is it bioidentical? And then two, is it the right dose for you is so important if this is going to be something that like a road you're going to go down. So make sure that you're working with somebody that's going to check those levels and make tweaks based on how you're responding to those hormone levels, correct? Yes. And one more thing I would add is we need to put the hormones in a healthy body. It's not really the hormones that are at fault here. If you are inflamed, if you have blood sugar spikes, if you're toxic because of all the chemicals in the environment, if your gut's not working properly, if you're constipated, if your liver's not properly detoxifying, and then we put the hormones in your system, well, you're the person who's more likely to have a side effect. So what we really want is we want to put the hormones in a healthy body because what we want is the benefits and we want to minimize any potential risks as much as possible. And so that's where taking a whole person approach can really make a big difference. Mm -hmm. I love it. It is so important because taking hormones itself is not going to fix every problem if the root cause is still there. That's right. So what would be the major difference between perimenopause and menopausal hormone replacement? So perimenopausal women are usually still doing a pretty good job of making estrogen. Um, but the two that they commonly need, if we're thinking about women's sex hormones here mm-hmm. is estrogen uh, is sorry, not estrogen is progesterone and testosterone. And we haven't really talked about testosterone yet. And maybe hopefully we'll have a second to talk about that. Once women go through menopause, now their estrogen levels drop. So now we're talking about estrogen and progesterone and they work together. So we need them both. Um, and then often testosterone as well. Mm-hmm. But you know, not every woman needs every one of these. So it's individual. We need to know your levels and know which one you need. Um, But testosterone is a really important one that often does not get replaced. Um, There is no FDA approved form of bioidentical progesterone, sorry, bioidentical testosterone for women. There actually are FDA approved progesterones and estrogens um, that are bioidentical that do come from a pharmaceutical company. You can get them at, you know, Walmart pharmacy or, you know, your regular pharmacy. Um, But there is no testosterone like that. There is, however, a pill that has a drug form of testosterone in it, um, along with estrogen. It's called um, uh, methyl test. And um, that's something that I would not recommend. We really want bioidentical forms of these hormones. So testosterone, if yours is low, women often feel kind of flat because testosterone is our motivation, get up and go, get things done, our drive, um, our confidence, our self-esteem, our decisiveness. So when testosterone goes down, we just kind of feel flat. We put one foot in front of the other, we make our way through our day. If it really has to get done today, we'll do it. If it could wait till another day, we kind of just leave it because we're not really feeling it today. Interest in intimacy, goes down. Like we just don't really care anymore. Like, honestly, we'd rather just go to sleep. Um, dry skin, aging skin, saggy skin, you know, you start to get the jowls here and the chicken wings here. Um, it affects the strength of our muscles and bones. So muscle tone kind of goes down. And I have a lot of women who are especially complaining that they can't lose weight. And so they go to the gym and they start some exercise regimen and they're not really seeing any improvements in their muscle tone or in their strength. And that could be from low testosterone. Mm -hmm. Um, So it's another really important one. All of them work together. And so we kind of want to consider all of them. Oh, I think that is so super important. And as women, we really don't talk much about testosterone, but it is so needed for our overall hormone balance when it comes to our sex hormones. Um, If you're okay with it, I'd love to transition a little bit and talk about our male counterparts and how you know, we, we really focus on women and our hormone changes and how it makes us really change and potentially go a little crazy or become somebody that we're not typically. Do men go through something similar? They sure do. But, you know, for women, 
it's still hard sometimes to know if how you're feeling is because of a hormone imbalance, but if your periods change, if you're going through menopause and you're getting hot flashes, there we have some clues that can tell us what's going on. For men, they don't have that kind of same, you know, cycle thing or, or clue. What happens for men is just very gradually over time, their testosterone level kind of goes downhill with age. And there are a whole bunch of other factors that can cause testosterone to go downhill too. So these toxins that we're talking about, um, one in particular is we used to have antibacterial soap everywhere, mm -hmm. but the chemical ingredient in that antibacterial soap is one of the things that interferes with hormones and can lower testosterone levels in men. Another one is atrazine, which is an herbicide that we spray on the plants and then it runs off into the stream and it can turn boy frogs into girl frogs. But we are getting this in our system too. And there's not really any good studies that show what it does to boy humans because who's signing up to be in that study, right? Get a whole bunch of atrazine and see what it does to you. So we know that there are a lot of hormone disrupting chemicals that affect men. We know that stress impacts cortisol levels, which shuts down testosterone for men, just like it does for women. Um, so there's, there's you know, poor nutrition and, and poor lifestyle habits. There's a whole list of things, prescription drugs, um, non-prescription drugs, opiates, pain medication, whole list of things that can make testosterone levels go down in addition to the natural aging. And what ends up happening when testosterone levels are low are all the same things as women. We lose drive, confidence, motivation, self-esteem. And so men, again, just feel kind of blah. They don't really feel like, you know, that drive is just missing. They kind of just want to, you know, sit on the couch and watch golf instead of getting out there in the world. Interest in sex kind of goes down. Erectile function kind of goes down. Muscle mass and strength can be affected. They tend to gain more weight because testosterone keeps them lean and they lose the testosterone. Um, so it's, it's actually quite similar for men and women. We just swap out erectile dysfunction and vaginal dryness, but it has a humongous role on men. It, these hormones affect who we are how we relate to other people, how we react to the world around us. And there's been some really interesting studies that even um, have looked at stock traders and they drew their testosterone levels first thing in the morning. And then they observed them on the stock trading floor. And the men with the highest testosterone levels made the riskiest trades and made the most money on that given day. So I'm not saying that's good or bad, but what I'm saying is it changes behavior. And so a lot of men know that they don't feel how they used to. Most of the time, what I hear them say is, well, I guess it's maybe just my age. I hear that so often. And even more for men, I hear from women too, but even more so for men. And like, okay, I get it. You're not 18 anymore. But if you're 95, we'll blame it on your age. If you're 45 or 55, uh-uh, like there's something wrong. You should still have energy and drive and and you should still be able to have a good sex life and, and you should still want to get out there and do stuff. So uh, men, I find, are pretty good at predicting if their testosterone level is off. Like if I ask, what do you think we're going to find? Most of the time, if their testosterone level comes back great, they'll tell me, I think it's going to be fine. And the guys who say, yeah, I think there could be a problem there, they're usually right. That is interesting because women are a little different when you ask them those questions. It's like, I think it's because they've been searching so long though, and they've been told everything's fine, everything's fine, that they go, I just don't know. Yeah. And, and they're, they're complicated. Worried. Yeah, we're complicated. Our hormones go up and down and, you know, we got different ones to think about. And so we are more complicated. Men actually, as a doctor, men are much simpler to get back in balance. The hard part is getting them to accept that there might be a problem and coming in to look for the help. That's the trickier part with the guys. I agree completely. And that's probably, not probably, that is one of the reasons why men see change, especially with weight loss sooner than women do. So like when women and like husbands and wives get on like a cleaner eating, they start to make changes, like they get out walking. They're like, oh my gosh, my husband's dropped 20 pounds already and I've only lost two. So Part frustrating, isn't it? Is the hormone differences. So how so when it comes to men whose testosterone has been lowered is there a bioidentical hormone that they're able to use in order to help 
um, rebalance their testosterone while or after they've done the lifestyle and the detox and that kind of stuff as well. So just the same as with the ladies, we want healthy lifestyle. We want to help their liver to get the toxins out of their system and avoid exposures. We need a healthy gut. And, and mm -hmm. if testosterone is kind of just medium, those things are often enough to get it back to where it should be, especially dealing with stress is a huge one. But sometimes the testosterone is pretty low or the lifestyle habits are not enough to get it where it needs to be. And then we can use hormone replacement for men. And there is no synthetic testosterone on the market. It's all bioidentical. It's only women that get given the synthetic form of the drugs. But there, there is testosterone topical gel or cream. There's testosterone injections. There's, there's pellets for men and for women, um, which would look like a little Tic Tac that go under your skin. There's all sorts of different ways that we can do it. We even have um, prescription medicines that we can use sometimes to help boost testosterone for the short term. And then we can stop the medicines. And, and sometimes that just kind of gets the system going again while we've addressed all the other things. So I don't really like using prescription medicines, um, but there, that's a certain case in men where we can sometimes in the short term jumpstart the system. Mm -hmm. But um, it's, it's easier for men to get tested but I do want to say that the same thing for women, if men march into their primary care doctor's office and ask to be tested, they'll have better success at getting tested. But oftentimes it's just a total testosterone that's looked at. If it lands anywhere within what the lab says is the normal range, they'll be told they're normal. The lab range is, it varies depending on your lab. Mm -hmm. And especially at the low end, there's a whole bunch of, um, you know, differences of opinion as to what would constitute low testosterone. So some labs say anything below 350, some labs say it has to be below 200, some labs say or 300, some labs say it has to be below 250. So let's just say your lab says 300 and you show up and you're 301, you're told you're normal. If you'd gone to the other lab that flags it at 350, you would have been told that you were too low if you're 301. So the lowish end of the normal is not where you want to be. You would want to be at least in the middle of the range, if not tipped a little on the upper end of the range. Mm -hmm. And even if your doctor measures it, if you're down at the low end of the range, or, you know, even in normal at the low end of the range, you probably would really feel good and be healthier if we could help you to optimize it, whether it was with lifestyle habits or whatever. But it's important to look at the other hormones. So we said for women, we want to look at the different hormones and how they relate to each other. So for men, we need to look at an estrogen level two. Estrogen is made out of testosterone. So if a man has low testosterone, they're probably going to have low estrogen. And that promotes bone loss and heart problems in men. So they need a little bit of estrogen to be healthy. The bigger problem is if testosterone is wherever it is and the estrogen is relatively speaking too high, that makes men not feel good. That can promote prostate growth and then they can't pee properly. It promotes erectile dysfunction, anxiety, weight gain. They don't feel good. Fluid retention. But if that was the case, but nobody measured it or somebody measured it and didn't know what to do with the information, if we give testosterone replacement, it's just going to get flipped into estrogen. The estrogen is going to get higher. They're not going to feel better. They're going to say, well, this testosterone didn't work for me, or they'll keep taking it and potentially get the side effects of the estrogen. I see that all the time. Mm -hmm. um, I've even had, you know, we've explained this to the wives, the wives tell their husband, the husband tells their doctor, I want you to measure my estrogen level. The estrogen level comes back. It's too high, but the doctor doesn't know what to do with it. So they do nothing. I had a man come in and his estradiol level, that's the estrogen we measured, was a hundred. It should be somewhere in the twenties. My estradiol level was a hundred. So this guy had the same estrogen as I did. Um, and he didn't feel good. You know, he was a corporate um, banker and he used to talk about how he would sit at the table. We live in Charlotte. So there's a lot of banking here and they would sit at the table and have video conferences with the big wigs in New York. And so he would be sitting there with all these super high level executives at the bank. And he would keep like feeling the tears welling up and getting all emotional and have to run out of the um, meeting because he didn't want them to see that he's boo-hooing over whatever they're talking about. And that was not normal for him, but he didn't understand. So um, it's, again, it's something that the regular doctors just don't know. I mean, they mean, well, they want to help. They, they just, they, that's not part of their training. They don't know what they don't know, but it's so important for men, just like for women, they need to find somebody who really can help them in a more holistic way and not just say testosterone low, knee jerk, here's your testosterone gel. 
100%. Dr. Deb, what's the book you wrote that uh, all of my listeners can purchase for either them to better understand what's happening with their husbands or to give it as maybe a gift to a yeah. brother? Uh... So I wrote a book called Why Can't I Keep Up Anymore? It is a guide to regaining energy, focus, and peak physical and sexual performance for men over 40. And I wrote it because all the time we have our ladies come in, we get them feeling great. We get them, you know, their mojo back in the bedroom. And then they come back and say, hey, do you see men? Because my husband <laughs> is just not keeping up with me anymore. Um, and so we do see a lot of men. Most of them are referred in by their significant others. And it's really important for the man to know they can feel better too. Too, mm -hmm. um, but but going to you see a regular doctor is not really going to get you there. No, and I think you know my women in wellness tribe have had that beat into them over and over the years that they understand that they got to look for somebody who thinks outside the box. So. Thank you. Oh well, my gosh, like such amazing information. I think we could talk for hours on hormones. It's one of my loves. So thank you. Thank you. I have a few questions just to sure. like fun, personal questions just sure. to see where you're at. So what is your favorite beverage, Dr. Deb? Oh, my favorite beverage is tea. I drink a lot of tea, green tea, black tea, um, but that's tea? what I enjoy. Okay. What's your favorite meal? Ah, well, my favorite meal that I actually eat would be a whole plate of vegetables with some kind of shrimp or chicken or something sprinkled on top kind of as a condiment. Um, I doesn't even matter what vegetables, but that's what I eat all the time. Love it. My favorite food that I don't eat <laughs> is nachos. I love nachos, but of course the cheese, the corn does not agree with me. So if you were to ever see me in a Mexican restaurant eating a plate full of nachos, you will know I just had the worst day of my whole life. I'm completely overwhelmed, exhausted. That is my drug of choice. Um, I don't care about wine. I don't really care that much about chocolate. I care about the nachos. Oh, funny. That's, we're just so different as human beings that we go to different things. What is your favorite song to get you like pumped up, motivated, good time kind of thing? Oh, let's see. Um, I don't know. I, I grew up in the 80s. And so I would say that my favorite band is Depeche Mode. And so pretty much anything from that just brings on the nostalgia and uh, kind of gets me in a good mood, even oh. though it's kind of dark songs, but nonetheless. <laughs> <laughs> and then what do you have on your night, sa night side table? Hmm. I have like a little stand that has um, a bunch of books in it. And the book that's on there right now is East of Eden by John Steinbeck that um, I started reading a long, I don't know, I've read it, this is my second time reading it, started reading it months ago, never really finished. I've read a million like personal development books in between. Here's the one I'm using to hold up my, um, my microphone stand, um, but that's what's on there, East of Eden. Awesome. Well, thank you so very much. Tell my listeners where they can find you so that, you know, if they're interested in more information about bioidentical hormones, how can they find you? Yeah. My website is signaturewellness.org. So .org, not .com, but Signature Wellness is my practice. There's lots of information on the website. Um, another way to find more information is so we talked about the book that I wrote for men but first I wrote a book for women it's called this is not normal a busy woman's guide to symptoms of hormone imbalance and it's got a lot of checklists and explanations so you can kind of go through and read the different chapters to sort of figure out for yourself if maybe it is your hormones that are out of balance and you can actually get a free copy of that one at is it your hormones.com um, you can get a free ebook there or of course the regular book is available on amazon Perfect. And I'll make sure guys to have that in the show notes. So go ahead, click through there. And thank you so much for being on here with me, Dr. Deb. It was such a great conversation about hormones and looking at them uh, both from a root cause and then looking at, okay, what can we do if things are still out of whack? So thank you. I appreciate it. Thanks. It was fun. I hope you enjoyed this episode of Women in Wellness as much as I did. If you did, please leave a review and a rating so that others can also benefit from the information being shared. Make sure to subscribe as new content is released on Women in Wellness Wednesdays. And if you want to connect with us, go online 
to womenandwellness.com. That's women, the letter N, wellness.com. I look forward to seeing you next time.